hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Design Meets. My name is Ian Chalmers. I'm the experienced designer and founder of Design Meets and Pivot Design Group here in Toronto. In an important step to truth and reconciliation, and as a member of Canadian society, we acknowledge the traditional lands that our studio occupies. We're grateful for these lands and have the utmost respect and recognition of Indigenous peoples, their circular practices, and ways of knowing. Our path forward is together. So Design Meets, some of you, I, I noticed have been to our events in the past, some of you have been speakers at our events in the past, but we started in 2010 as sort of a community platform to exchange ideas, you know, for designers, non-designers to kind of get inspired by one another, learn to be collaborative, uh, find meaningful ways to put design and its transformative power to work. Uh, transformative is a key word for today's uh, theme. And that's for sure. Our last event, if uh, any anyone was here for that one, it was back in October, way back in October, uh, we looked at design and new directions in AI. Um, it was a very entertaining and enlightening conversation about the growing impact of technology, the explosion of AI and the effect on our lives. As designers and as a design community, we bear a very important responsibility for the future of machine learning to ensure that it's empathetic, it's creative, it's user-centered and free of discrimination and bias. If you'd like more information on that event, on the recap at least, please be sure to visit designmeets.ca. That brings me to the topic for today in design and the circular economy, a very important topic that uh, we are very curious about and very interested in. Today's economy is best described as linear. It's a system, to des system designed to extract raw materials out of nature, process them into usable goods, all to satisfy our human needs. And then we discard them when they're no longer useful. Also known as take, make, waste. This linear economy is out of step with our natural circular world and we know we need to make change. Here's a quote of uh, a very impactful negative effect on our, on our planet. The way that we're not restoring, the way that we're not reinvesting, how, what we're taking out, it's just not sustainable for our planet. We need to transform every aspect of this sort of take, make, waste system. In Canada, we consume materials, energy, and water at one of the highest rates in the world. Compared to the Netherlands, where 30% comes from materials that are recycled and reused. We need to come up with a better plan to manage the precious natural resources, how we make products, how we use products, and what we do with the materials afterwards. One of our favorite things to talk about, of course, is design. And we do think design is at the center of everything, Thibaut, um, just so you know. This is about designing waste and pollution out of the system. This is about circulating products and materials back into the system. This is about regenerating, redistributing, and restoring natural systems. So the good news for those in the design community is that we kind of reside at the apex of the circular economy and its potential to be transformative. It really allows us to sort of rethink, reimagine, you know, redesign, and prototype the products and systems that we use. As designers, it's our responsibility to think about this very critically and about design and how we can create products built to last, ones that are desirable and needed, durable, repairable, reusable, adaptable, and modular, to name a few. Today, we're very fortunate to have a very knowledgeable and informed expert in the field of circular economy as our guest speaker. And I'm going to introduce Thibaut Watelet, and I'm going to read his bio. You may have read his bio, but in case you haven't read his bio, I'm just going to go over it. I hope you don't mind, Thibaut. Thibaut is a passionate sustainability leader at the interface of circularity and innovation. 
He loves to challenge the status quo and strive for the transition to a regenerative, resilient, and circular economy. Thibault works at Positive Impact in Luxembourg and has contributed to several strategic circular economy projects, including the National Zero Waste Strategy and a National Guide for Sustainable Neighborhood Development. Since 2018, he's been leading the international initiative called Product Circularity Datasheet, a project launched by the Ministry of the Economy in Luxembourg to develop an industry standard for communicating circularity product data across the supply chain. How does that sound? Fairly accurate? Great. Well, welcome Thibault. Our format today is a little different for everyone. Um, Thibault will be presenting his work and thinking on CE, on circular economy for about 15 to 20 minutes. He also wants to engage with, uh, with the audience, with uh, anyone that is here. So we may ask some questions and feel free to participate through the chat. And uh, afterwards, we can then break out into further questions uh, and answers should you have them. So grab your coffee and tea in your reusable container and uh, get comfortable. Okay, great. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And I'm quite excited to be here um, because like you nicely introduced, I think designer and will I will share why designer plays an important role in the circular economy. And it's really at the heart of the circular economy. And for the agenda or the few slides I will share today, uh, I wanted to make a short uh, description of this linear economy. And you already introduced that, uh, Jan, previously. So I will not take too much time on that because what I wanted really to focus is on the cradle to cradle philosophy to explain what is it, because it's really at the heart of this circular economy and plays an important role. And then I will show some example of what is circular economy in practice and how it translates into design, but also in terms of business model and how we could see some good examples that are quite inspiring uh, around here. So when you look at this take, make, waste uh, linear economy, like it is described really in a very simplistic way, there are three main uh, logic behind this economic system. It was um, over the last century, uh, we have a really cheap and easily accessible resources. And due to that, we were able to produce and really uh, make products at a cheap price. And it all ended up with really waste. And that's really uh, currently one of the key challenges that all this waste, but also all this negative impact that uh, are on the earth. And with really this hypothesis that we have an infinite regenerative capacity of the earth, which is not the case. And we see uh, recently with these uh, two crises, the COVID, but also what is happening in Ukraine, uh, there are a lot of different uh, change in terms of accessibility for resources and in terms of price, uh, which is a key impact for companies. And when you see that uh, in terms of waste, if you take just an example for the clothing industry, that every year uh, and every five minutes, there is one million piece of clothes that are produced. And every second, there is one complete garbage truck that are disposing, landfilling the clothes. So you see over this uh, one hour, there will be quite a lot of tons of different clothes that will be um, uh, disposed and also uh, incinerated. And over the last, um, I would say 20 years, 30 years, we have uh, trying to handle this waste by collecting them, and recycling them. And recycling has becoming quite a, a good approach of tackling this uh, problem of both waste. But one question to the audience is really, when you look at, for example, the garment industry and the textile, how much percentage of this textile is effectively recycled into a new textile? If you take a t-shirt, how much percentage globally it's recycled into a textile? And if you could maybe, write this presentation into the chat um, and then i will share maybe the results so i cannot see the chat but i see that people well, you starting. have we have 30 percent okay 30 percent only 30 percent or we have five percent okay we are getting closer <laughs> <laughs> so okay. there the was uh, how, and how one percent one, is, one yeah. percent yeah one percent was uh, uh, Oh, when you look nine percent to ouch yeah so yeah. we're we're pretty low there uh, yeah. uh the one person the person that put one percent is an knowledge is a knowledgeable uh, person yeah. on the subject matter so yeah and, and you see here it's um it's not a recent study but uh, we are close to the one percent 
and really it's the closed loop that we are looking but when you see that all the textile uh, there is just one percent that really is effectively uh, returned into a close so which is very low and you have a similar trend uh, on the plastic side, uh, which is, um, I have another graph also there, and we are around in plastic packaging. It is in French, the number, but we are really close to 2%. In Europe, a PET button, uh, one out of 10 PET button is really effectively recycled into one PET button. So it's even lower. So we are around 10% there. So we have focused really on this, on this recycling and we see that it's not working but one of the key fundamental change that needs to happen is really on the design side because our product and our system is not really designed for it it's not because uh, the recycling technology are not there they are there but our product have not been designed to be recycled properly in a high quality way and this approach of the cradle to cradle philosophy is providing quite a great uh, inspiring tools on how we can address this challenge and how can we create a more regenerative and how can we change the shift from a linear economy to a circular economy. So it's not a new topic. Uh, there have been two people working on this, Michael, uh, Michael Brockner and Bill McDonald. So on the bottom is Bill McDonald, he's an architect, by the, so it's a designer and the other person, Michael, is a chemist, a German chemical uh, chemist. It was quite active in uh, Greenpeace. And when they met together, they have been uh, looking at how they could address this problematic about uh, environmental crisis and uh, all these products that were designed not properly. And they have uh, written this book, Cradle to Cradle, how to remake uh, the way that we make things. It's quite inspiring. If you have the opportunity to read this book, it's quite good. And this philosophy, they inspired by nature. And applying the credit to credit philosophy is really to look at a company like a tree and an economy like a forest. So you design in such a way there is no waste in nature. And there is a quite synergy between the different resources used in the forest, between the different uh, trees in the forest, but also all the different species living in the forest. So the idea of uh, the credit to credit is really to look at this uh, reduction and remove of the, the waste, but also this synergy between the different uh, actors. The second aspect, which is really at the earth of this philosophy, and when you start to design a product or a solution, it's really this intention. What is your intention or the purpose of your product or your solution? And over the last um, 20 years with the sustainable development, we have been told that we should reduce our impact. We, are, we have to reduce the pollution, we have to reduce the CO2 emission, we have to reduce the consumption in terms of energy. And that has been really the driver here. How can we minimize this negative impact that we have on the environment and on the health? Whereas in the credit to credit philosophy, the idea is really to go beyond that and really to have a different mindset on how you could approach the design of product and solution. And really the idea is how can we maximize this positive impact. So it's really about quality and performance improvement and doing good. So how can we design a product that regenerates the biodiversity? How can we design a building that generates more energy than it consumes? So it's totally different mindset. And in my perspective, it's quite much more exciting to work on a product when you know that you will create a positive impact behind that. And one of the great example is uh, this carpet that has been done by Desso, uh, the Air Master. And the approach was really at the air, the credit to credit philosophy. And they have been able to design a carpet that actively improved the air quality. So they have engineered the fiber in such a way that they could capture uh, the harmful particle. And when you know that we are spending 90% of our time indoors, in office, in homes, this has a huge impact on the human health. So it's totally different mindset that's saying that I reduce uh, the air quality or the air pollution by 40%, but it's still polluting. Here is really to see how we can improve and make a positive impact. Then in the credit to credit philosophy, there are three main principles that I will shortly describe. But the first is quite evident currently is that we have to build the system on 100% renewable energy. 
and one of these sources, the sun, and all the derivatives from the sun, the wind, uh, and the geothermal uh, energy, and uh, all the other renewable energy. The second principle is about uh, diversity. It's really to celebrate this diversity, and this can be translated that we should design solutions that are adapted to the local resources that are available locally to the local culture, considering this uh, diversity in terms of cultures, in terms of human, and in terms of species. And also this principle that there is not one solution that fits all, that you have really to look into the context when you are designing uh, this solution and really celebrate and embrace this diversity. And the last principle is really one of the earth of the circular economy is that we have to eradicate this notion of waste. Currently, we are designing product in, in a way that we know that at some point it will become a waste. But we should rethink differently and say, this product is a resources. How can I design this product in such a way that it could go through different cycles and goes back to the new product? And there's this principle in the quarter to quarter philosophy that you have two cycles, the biological cycle and technical cycle. And the idea with the biological cycle is that all the materials that are supposed at some point to enter the biosphere, so it could be wear, could be emission of a different particle due to erosion or due to emissivity of the product, they should be designed in such a way that they could re-enter the biosphere safely. And the other product, we should keep them in the technical cycle in such a way that you could reuse them for other products and return them to uh, into new product. So to exemplify or to give an example of how does it translate this third principle into a product, I'm taking the tire and just asking to the audience, what is the technical, uh, what is the cycle that this product is currently and how it should be designed? Is it the technical cycle or the biological cycle based on what I just explained? Okay, we have, it currently is technical, but could be biological. Technical. Yeah. Biological, biological. Currently biological, could, but could be technical. Technical. Actually, it's a, too quick, uh, it's a tricky question because it could be It is be a tricky both. question. <laughs> yeah. The safe thing is to put a question mark beside your answer. Yeah. So, um, and that's a pretty technical. Neither uh, nor. You have a neither nor. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, that's a product I know well because I've been working five years uh, in the tire industry. And when you look at, at uh, tires, there is one part which is uh, the thread part, uh, the design part, which is uh, worn out throughout the life of these uh, tires. But one of the key challenges with tires, and we often forget that, is this, all this microplastic. And for the tires, there was a study that um, annually it accounts to five, more than 500,000 tons of microplastic. And some people can say, oh, yeah, we don't care about microplastic because it goes just in the ocean. There was a recent study that was published uh, one, uh, one day ago by um, a Dutch researcher. And it's the first time that they found microplastic in the blood of people. And they make a sample study of different people. So they found microplastic in our blood. And so they don't know yet what is the impact, but you see that these microplastic are going everywhere. And we know that there is an evocative impact on the environment. So the idea with the tire currently with this traditional sustainable uh, development, and it's not a bad thing, uh, don't get me wrong, but with this mindset of minimizing the negative impact, we have come with different solution. Maybe we could work on the thread wear, we could uh, create the tires that last longer. And so they create the same amount of microplastic, but for a longer lifetime. And recently I've read uh, this solution that was a, a collector of this particle that will be attached to the car and that could collect some particles. But they say that the efficiency will be only 60%. So there will be still 40% of the particle that will go in the environment. So, and you're right that it could be either technical or biological, but if you really, you have to design this product in such a way that it could create this positive impact. 
the idea would be, and there was a concept that was developed by Goodyear, it's the concept tire. But the idea is really to have this part that we know that will be worn out throughout the, the life of the tire that could be biodegradable and could have a positive impact on the nature. And the other part, which is really the casing of the, the tire that could be reused or maybe recycled much more easily and that should go in the technical cycle. But really this mindset should change. If you are going really this, with this mindset of positive impacts, you, have, uh, you can really go and went with, uh, go with different solution about how you can create a new tires. So that's really the, this idea of uh, the cradle to cradle. What I wanted also to discuss now is more how the circular economy can be translated into practice. So there are these nice principles. Um, and you have often, when you type circular economy on the web, uh, you have probably seen this uh, graph about these two loops. So these two uh, cycles, the technical and the biological cycle. Uh, this is from the Mercato Foundation. We, at least in our uh, company, positive impact, and also in over the last uh, 10 years of practicing circular economy with company, we are not using this graph because it's a little bit complex for us. So I wanted to, to present a new perspective on how we approach circular economy with organization and with other type of people to explain this concept of the value here. So you have to look at this graph that you have different steps of producing uh, the product from really the, the raw materials to uh, the final product. And at each step, we are adding value. And so that's why we call this a value hill concept. In the current linear economy, we design our product in such a way that most of the time when we don't need them anymore, they are becoming scrap. Either they are incinerated. And when you look in terms of value, we are quite destroying this value because the scrap from the steel uh, structure here has a lower value than the material that you could get from vernier material. So this is a really problem when you want to use uh, recycled material because the quality is lower and it's very difficult uh, to increase this um, use of recycled content, even if we have great recycling technology. And that's a huge problem for the circular economy. The idea with the circular economy is really to look at how can we better use our product throughout the life cycle of this product? And this really starts at the design phase. The first part is really how can we design product and solution that could last longer, that could be used longer for different loops. But then you have all the other side before recycling is how can we design this product or solution that could uh, facilitate this redistribution, this reuse, this uh, we recover components to refurbish, remanufacture, and really at the end, how can we cycle back those materials into new product? So you have really this concept of how can we make a better use of our resources throughout the life cycle. But this really needs to start at the design phase. And to just give you some example of those different loops here, we have the first loop is really, how can we design product for multiple usage? And these are key examples. Um, you have, of course, the glass, the plastic glass to uh, a glass made of glass. But you have really the, the loop or the repack is really to see in packaging, there are a lot of single use packaging, but whereas we could design packaging to be reused for multiple times. So it's really to think about the function of this product and the necessity of this product and how we could design maybe this product for multiple usage by adapting some of the characteristics of the product. The other part is about easy repair and maintenance. And one of the good examples is Fairphone. And they have designed with this um, a mobile phone so you could easily um, disassemble the different components and repair them. So by changing them easily, and there is also uh, a guidance for that. You see also in terms of law, uh, it's on, the right side is in French, but it's a French uh, law that has been uh, amended and it's in place uh, since this year that each electronic material uh, products that are on the market should have this uh, repairability index, which show how repairable is your product. And there is a different list of criteria that should match to get this uh, rating. 
And, and there is a high demand for this easy repair and maintenance. But you see that you have to design also this product for, for this easily disassembly. And as a good aspect of how you could have a better use of a product, and this is a company in Belgium, uh, they were facing a lot of competition in terms of furniture due to the um, uh, IKEA model with low price. And they were looking at how can they could be competitive in the marketplace and design product that could still uh, be bought by the local market. And they come up with an idea we could design a, uh, a bed for the kids that could be adaptable and upgradable through the life of these kids as it grows. And so you have this different concept that has been put in place and now they are still competitive for the marketplace. They have to come up with a different solution or how we could design uh, this type of uh, furniture. In the same philosophy, when you look at the product, uh, there is also this product as service and sharing. It's more on the business model, but this has a huge impact on how you design your product. Uh, the first example is uh, Philips. Uh, there was a request from um, the architect Thomas Rowe in the Netherlands. He said, what I want is not the product itself. It's not the lighting. What I want is the function that this product delivers. It's the lumen. I want lumen and I want light for my office. Can you provide a service that includes that? And this is a totally different philosophy when you are developing the product because you need to develop this product in such a way that you could easily maintain, repair them because you are not selling it anymore, but you are providing a service attached to this and you are still the owner of this product. And it seems for the other, like Bundles is um, a company which is not selling any more washing machine, but they are providing a service that you rent the, the, the washing machine and you pay per wash. So they also have a contract with um, the producer of the washing machine to see how they could extend the life cycle of this machine in such a way that it could uh, last longer. And Hallsoys is quite a good example because they faced some competition or some uh, difficulties. Um, it was in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, at, the, at that time, the plane where uh, the technology for the plane and also for the motor uh, were getting better. So over the life cycle of one plane, they were not selling two motors or replacing the motor. So they were just selling one motor per airplane. And this was a huge impact or negative impact on their business case. So they were thinking differently, how can we still provide added services? And now they are uh, selling not anymore their uh, motors to the uh, airplane company, but they are selling a service uh, that they pay per hour of operation. So there also they have to think differently about the product, how they could last longer with a much more quality and a, a better performance, but also how can we repair them easily so we are not uh, losing too much money on that. You have this loop about uh, redistributing, using um, this since the COVID and uh, even before it was becoming a huge trend about the second hand. Uh, you have an example uh, on the left side is um, it's in, in Finland. It's the first mall where you are selling juice uh, reuse product, it's called Retuna. Uh, and it's quite impressive when you look at this uh, shopping mall, there's just uh, secondhand products. We see also in Europe a, a kind of trend in the luxury product that uh, the secondhand is becoming a, a trend uh, where we could have seen five years ago or 10 years ago that will not be the case. But we see also in the construction here by Cassia is in, uh, in France. But there is a, a huge demand now for um, reuse of uh, materials from the construction site. Then you have the, the, the last or almost the last loop uh, is to recover, to refurbish materials. And here what is very important is uh, you have to think your product so it could be designed for this assembly. Uh, one of the good example uh, is this uh, precast structure by PECO. It's, um, it's a Finnish company. Normally for concrete uh, structure, you are not doing this kind of uh, assembly. You are selling everything with concrete and you are not able anymore to disassemble them. And what they were able to do is that um, they have used this connection um, so they could be able after 10 years or 20 years 
to easily disassemble them, but also to reuse those components in another building. So they have really changed and, and look at some solution, how we could uh, create this reversible connection in such a way that we could be able, after a certain life of time, to recover those materials much more easily. You have also the refurbishment market that has been increasing a lot. Uh, one of the company, Back Market, uh, that was uh, in France that has started, and now it, they reached a value, it was uh, beginning of this year, of $5, uh, five billion. Uh, dollars which is quite impressive because when you look back 10 years ago, refurbishment was not really a trend and nobody wanted to refurbish a smartphone. And now it's becoming something quite common to buy a refurbished device. And there is a quite a trust in this refurbished device that has been implemented. Here we have another example of uh, remanufacturing is Caterpillar. So they are selling also the product with this mindset that they could easily we manufacture some component and access this component. So there's really this uh, life cycle approach about what are the critical components in the product and how we could easily access them and remanufacture them. So our product can last longer and it's added value for the customer who are using uh, this product. And then the last point, it might be of use that we should design our product for recyclability, but most of the time our products are not designed for that because it's difficult to dismantle and to separate the different components. And just to give two examples, um, and that's the last example for the circular economy in practice. On the left side, uh, you have uh, running shoes. Traditionally running shoes, there is between 12 and 16 different fibers, materials in the, in the shoes. And Adidas was trying to look at this problematic about recyclability, on how can we design a shoes or running shoe that is much more easy to recycle? And they say, oh, let's look at the material and can we have a mono material that could play all around the different fibers? So it's much more easier to recycle it. And so this is still a concept there with the filter craft loop, but they use just one material. And the idea is really that they just uh, thread the shoes at the end of the life. And so they could reuse this material directly. So it's really facilitating the dismantling and separability of the materials. And the same with the example here of mud jeans. They try to look at uh, the jeans and also the design, how we could easily dismantle and separate different materials. So we could either recover these materials or uh, easily recycle them. Because this separability might be something simple, but in practice, it's a huge problem for recyclability. So maybe to, to finalize, uh, and I will finish here, is that in our view and my view, circular economy is not an end goal. It's not what we want to achieve, but circular economy is really a philosophy, a design philosophy that provides a set of tools that could address your business challenge while creating positive impact. And there are two keys that you have to look when you want to really uh, implement circular economy. And you have seen through these different examples that I've provided, you have to work on the one side of the product, either to design your product for disassembly, for easy maintenance, but also work at the same time of the business model. So you have to adapt your business model so in such a way that you could capture this value about the change uh, in terms of product design. And I will finish with this nice picture and actually, uh, the singer, Pete uh, uh, Seeger, it's an American uh, folk singer. Um, and he created a song about that. If you can be reduced, reuse, repair, rebuild, or refurbish, or even refinish or resolve and recycle, then it should be restricted or redesigned or removed from production. And really, I invite everyone to look around about the different products that you have at home or that you are using on a regular basis. And to ask yourself about this key question, can I easily recover, refurbish this material? And if not, how I should design this product in such a way that it could enter into a circular economy? Excellent, thank you, Thibault. We're gonna take some questions, but before we do that, uh, we already have a few in, in the chat. Uh, I'd like to just start with the obvious, which comes back to or circles back to design. 
um, specifically, you know, the circular economy, circular design, the relationship that exists there. And you talked about the relationship. We talked about it being at the heart, uh, maybe, maybe even being at the beginning, but, you know, how do you, how do you see that relationship uh, and, and sort of what role do designers play in driving that sort of process? Like I say, it's really, for me, the, the circular economy is really a design philosophy. So it's really inherent to the circular economy when you want to put that in practice. But it's really started for me at uh, the beginning when you set the goals and the intention behind. And I will give an example um, of a project that we are currently uh, working on. Uh, it's a new school. And when you ask um, to the design team, and also the building, uh, the building, the owner of this school. What is the objective of a school? They will tell you, oh, it should be uh, designed on time, uh, meet the, um, the budget, that we should uh, also have this type of materials uh, built on renewable energy. And when you ask uh, really this question about, what about the, the, the student? What about the, the different teacher? And we say that normally a school should be an environment that is really helping students to succeed and to grow. And when you address this design about the school, how we should design it, you are taking, for example, in consideration the material health and how the materials that goes into the building and to see how we could design a, a, such an environment with much more lighting or natural lighting. And look at this. So, so, so you are looking at different criteria that you are not considering because it was not in the objective initially. So that's what really what we try to uh, emphasize with the different uh, organization or group of uh, people is really to set at the beginning of any project these goals and to consider really what is the intention and to drive for this positive attitude and not just limiting to reducing pollution, reducing uh, cost, reducing, uh, but really looking, how can we create added value by using those circular economy principles? So it's a quite different attitude. Um, and I think this create quite uh, positive impact because when you look at the team, when you say we are designing a school now that will uh, create an environment that is much more uh, helping students to develop themselves, it's much more exciting to say, oh, we are designing a school that uh, will reduce uh, by 20% uh, the use of resources and that will have a lower carbon footprint than traditional uh, school. Excellent, thank you. Lots of questions here. Um, I'm gonna come back to, uh, I just wanted to answer one question that someone had about the Goodyear concept. Uh, do you know if that's being adopted or scaled, just out of curiosity? Um, no, so it has been presented in 2020. Uh, but it's not yet adopted for the moment. And unfortunately, they are still in this philosophy of, uh, yeah, when you look at uh, this uh, sustainable tire, like they call it, it's uh, based on some recycled materials, but not, they are still not addressing this problematic about microplastic. So I hope it will come in the future, but that's something that they should consider. I think if we really want to have this positive mindset and create positive impact, because I think, a fully recycled tires that still have microplastic for me is not a sustainable tire. And that will not solve the problem about what we are having currently in terms of pollution and all the other consequences linked to that. Excellent. Um, here's a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is needed from a policy perspective to accelerate the implementation of a fully circular system? Naturally, Luxembourg, you know, Europe's perspective would be different than Canada's or North America's, but speaks to sort of the, the how do we accelerate implementation in your opinion? Yeah, currently that that's uh, the, the driver I've been the tax, but I think what we should do is more to provide incentive for the one who are pioneers. Uh, we have made some study um, uh, for Luxembourg um, for how can we stimulate circular business model or different type of business model like product as service. What is currently happening is that there is a lot of incentive for the linear economy. 
uh, you have a lot of uh, promotion still about all the business that are running in a linear way, if I could say that. Uh, and what we should focus in terms of incentives and how can we reward the people who are taking uh, this path about a circular journey because sometimes it's investment upfront that are not and the product are not competitive for the moment. When you look, for example, at a product or service, you need to make upfront investment because you need to be the owner of the product and you need to, to take the risk of selling, uh, owning the product that it will be used by another person and you don't have uh, the control about uh, those potential risks that could be go there. And so you don't have really incentive by the market and by the other uh, competition because it's still cheaper to buy a product than to lease a product. So it's really to see how we could provide a reward mechanism for that. Um, in Europe, uh, there is, uh, I would say, quite awareness from the European Commission and the European countries to work uh, towards more circular economy. And no later than yesterday, there was a publication for a new package of action. One of them is to have a digital product passport attached to the, the product. And one of, um, I think, the incentive more in terms of uh, regulation, it, it's really to require much more transparency of what is inside your product and how it has been designed and to disclose this information. Not maybe disclose the trade secrets, but at least to disclose how your product has been designed. Uh, and this information is not often available when you look at at many products, when we ask companies, uh, what is really the composition of this product? They say, oh, well, we are buying from this supplier, from these suppliers, but we don't know really what is inside. And there is, for example, the REACH regulation, which is about uh, a toxic substance and substance of AI concern. When you look in practice, this application of this uh, regulation is not working. Uh, over, there was a spot analysis of 6,000 products last year. And out of these 6,000 products that were on the market, 75% were not compliant. So it means that 75 of the products were having toxic substance that were not disclosed publicly to the user. Okay. So you see that those regulations are not working, but uh, mm -hmm. I think we have to really to work on this added value and how we could incentivize and make a reward mechanism for the one who are taking uh, this leading position of trying to transform their business model or their products and how we could help them. Great. We have a question on uh, your, your point of view on ESG reporting standards. Uh, you're familiar with ESG? Yeah. Um, so the question is, do you believe we're close to establishing global standards to create uniformity so investors can make informed decisions about companies' commitment to sustainability, diversity, and ethics? What is your POV on? ESG reporting mm -hmm. standards. I think what is still missing about ESG reporting uh, standards is um, this kind of uniformity, which is also there, because one of the key challenge about investor and also uh, ESG reporting when you need to invest is uh, how can you get access to such data that will help you to make the right decision. And currently, there is a very uh, a gap in terms of data about the circular economy. How do you measure circular economy performance of a company? There is not a standard about that for the moment. And that's one of the projects that we are, um, I'm currently working since uh, four years, uh, four years, and the product security data sheet. And the idea of this PCDS is really to have a standard on how can we communicate information on the circular economy properties of product in a much more transparent way throughout the supply chain. And I could help those uniform metrics by providing a much more transparent information on how your product has been designed in terms of circular economy and what are the properties linked to that. So for the moment, ESG is mainly used by large company as a compliance tool and uh, uh, to say we are compliant but it's not really stimulating this approach. How can we do better? It's more looking at I'm compliant and I'm just compliant. So I think we need much more uh, other standards or other type of information that will help that. I hope this PCDS uh, and also this digital product passport regulation will stimulate and help companies 
to be better informed about what is inside uh, the product and how they have been designed and how they are contributing to the circular economy. Great, great answer. Thank you. There is a there's a little chat going on too, just about uh, comments on the, the uh, modular phone. Uh, and uh, one of the participants uh, or attendees commented on, I wish we had that phone. And someone else said, well, um, it's more about end rather than supply, that uh, there is a capability to do this. It's just viability uh, is holding it back. Um, and then someone else commented on uh, the regulatory market in Canada and how telecoms make more money by selling you know, new phones with disposable devices, et cetera. So we know you've, you've even talked about that we're still in that sort of linear model, even from a business model point of view. But, uh, you know, there's, you spark some interest, I think, uh, with modularity uh, sample, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, what is interesting also uh, in this debate about electronic uh, device is that there is a lot of focus on the durability. How can we extend the life of uh, those electronic devices, and we tend to forget uh, that there is an obsolescence, which is not intended obsolescence, which is the technology. We know that for smartphone, it doesn't make sense to design smartphone that will last twenty years, because due to the technology evolution, that at some point it will not make sense to upgrade it because you have to wait to think. We change the motherboard and also the CPU, so it doesn't make sense there. What we are trying uh, and also to advise company for this type of product is to look at the intended uh, intended use of this product. What is the intended use period of this product? And in a smartphone, for example, uh, one of the focus should be how can we make this smartphone designed for easy disassembly and recovery of some components or some materials because there will be probably 10 percent or 20 percent of the people that will keep their smartphone for five seven six years maybe but the rest it will be like uh, between three and four years so we have also to look at this side and not just uh, say that we have to focus only on extending uh, the lifetime of the, the product so that's quite a um, a big debate because um, for some industry it's really focusing on extending this life cycle and saying oh, we are good doing good but when you look at the practical uh, use and this intended uh, use period is the opposite that, uh, due to this obsolescence about uh, technology that will have uh, some problems right one other maybe one other yeah. comment is that for fairphone um, we have used fairphone uh, it was a second generation. It was not so good, I can <laughs> give you. But uh, the, the, the fourth generation was even much more better. But one idea that was also put on the place because it's still in a linear business model. They're still selling smartphone. And at the end of the life of the smartphone, you cannot really return back the smartphone. And there is no uh, recycle process that has been put in place to really recover those materials. What uh, they have been uh, looking at with the national telecommunication in Netherlands is how can we sell, because when you buy a smartphone, it's not really to, for the tool that you are, or for the product. You buy it because you want to have a, a communication with uh, friends that you want to have access to your emails and to have different applications. But it's not really for the product of having this product. So it's more to access this function that are important. So why the national uh, telecommunication cannot or this telecommunication company could sell a service that is a communication uh, per hour that or access per hour to the smartphone. So it's a product as service for the smartphone. So it could be another way of uh, incentivize uh, modular phones or phones that are designed for the assembly. Absolutely. The opportunity is there. Uh, we just, it's a bit of behavior change and business society change, but uh, I want to, before we run out of time, uh, this comes back to, I think when we started, we were talking about even circularity as a trend. And uh, one of our questions that just came up here, do you think that you, there's awareness, there's enough awareness of circularity and its benefits among young activists and climate change engaged people? So how do we move from you know, just this thing, this idea, this trend into something that's actionable and almost, as you said, intentional. 
do you see there is enough awareness of circularity out there and the benefits in the young people in Europe, let's say? I think that there is an awareness about uh, the environmental impact that we are having about the product. Um, but what is still missing is more uh, this offering of product or solution versus uh, this demand. And what I really encourage people is when you go buying product, ask, is this product is designed for repairability? Is it designed for uh, recyclability? What is the percentage of recyclability of this product? If we start asking for each product, for each distributor, at some point they will say, okay, maybe we have to change something. And I think we need also to be more proactive there. Uh, if you are working in a company, asking your suppliers, uh, can you provide so much more information about the recycled content? Can you improve the recycled content? Can you design your product so I could easily disassemble it? Uh, we have been working, for example, with uh, the National Telecommunication Luxembourg. There is this box for uh, the internet that you need to install at home. Uh, and now they are thinking about asking the suppliers who designed this box, how can you design the box so we could easily disassemble and change components inside the box. So we could either replace some components for upgradability, or we could um, extend the lives of this box when there is a new version of the box. So I think by asking the question uh, to those different people, you start to raise awareness. At some point, they will see that there is a demand for that, and maybe there will be, you could trigger those actions. And just wrapping up on that, there is one comment here, but just on how consumer involvement is so critical and how that, that role of, of the consumer who often doesn't feel as though they have power, they do have power, can change, you know, make the sort of critical societal change to have an impact on how companies perceive products and their, their needs and wants as consumers. So, um, yeah. Do you feel it? Do you feel positive about that? The, the change coming from consumers. I think with everyone, um, we are part of the solution because we are also at the origin of the problem of creating this waste. So we are also part of this solution. So for me, every small step that you can make, at some point, it will have a bigger impact on the change. So. And that's really start uh, by asking yourself, um, because we are at the origin, myself and everyone uh, of this problematic about waste and increasing uh, this uh, uh, environmental impact or negative impact. So how can we change our behavior and trigger some action outside by changing our mindset and also asking those questions? Like I showed in the last slide, if it can be reduced or repair, then it should be redesigned and ask this question, okay, mm -hmm. can you do something about that? Can you do something about uh, making it recycle, resolve, or refurbish? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great points. Uh, a nice way to wrap up. Uh, and there are more questions, but I think what we'll do, and everyone, thank you for asking these questions. Uh, we will put them forward to Thibault um, in his spare time. Uh, maybe to have a reply, we will do a summary uh, blog post of this conversation. It's just the beginning for us, for a lot of us, for me, for my community. Uh, we will record it. And um, uh, this is a, a painting by Ed Ruska, uh, who is a favorite of many, but uh, this, this notion that we do have an opportunity to kind of to relook at things, to take a stand on this issue, to em embed it into our processes, which might be human-centered or user-centered, um, you know, it's going to take time. We know this is going to take time, but we can start this process and sort of have some sort of infect, some influence or impact uh, on, on our economy and towards sort of this more resilient future um, and more of a connection to nature. So design and circular economy is our future, and I believe we can have an impact. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Tipo for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. It's dinner time, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thanks to uh, Lauren from Pivot uh, for supporting the webinar, uh, for recording this. Uh, Steve, for your write-up. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for uh, hanging out with us today and just listening. 
Uh, we did this because we were just really curious. We wanted to start the conversation to kind of better understand what this idea of circular economy is. Our next event, we hope to have with the participation of Thibaut, I'm not volunteering you, Thibaut, but uh, we want to have at least three or four speakers who um, have actually applied uh, circular economy, circular design to their products and to learn from their examples um, that we can then take and apply to our to our uh, worlds, uh, which could be in education, in product design and service design, et cetera. So um, thank you again to everyone and uh, have a great last day of March. Thank you.